Hello friends, so welcome to Insights Conversation with Mahesh Dejpande. Mahesh is the Senior Director, Global Business Consultant, High Industry at Dissolve Systems. He is a seasoned technology product solution development executive driven by customer value, business impact and vision. Mahesh holds over 24 years of experience in R&D, business development, product innovation consulting and more. Today, we will discuss with Mahesh about 3D printing in semiconductor manufacturing, IC designing, and the underlying challenges, opportunities, and its scope. So Mahesh, welcome to our Insights Conversation today. Thanks, Anavika. Thanks. So uh, Mahesh, we will start with knowing about uh, how 3D printing is assisting in semiconductor manufacturing and dealing with the shortage the world is experiencing right now. Sure. So 3D printing in electronics and semiconductor in particular hasn't lived yet to the hype of you know, bringing the mass producibility and the complexity underlying in there, you know, primarily because semiconductors is a mass volume game and uh, additive manufacturing technologies are still cost prohibitive and time consuming for volumes, right? A large semiconductor company uh, can supply anywhere upward of 200 million plus products every day worldwide and uh, and the additive technologies are more suitable uh, for low volume more complexity things uh, it, that said uh, there is a much larger potential for application of 3d printing into semiconductor fabrication equipment you know the equipment that is making the semiconductor fabs run 24 by 7 all over the world you know producing uh, these these volumes and they're extremely complex uh, equipments uh, they are fully automated uh, they are multidisciplinary and the underlying complexity of the parts and the vol low volume nature really lends itself to 3d printing and there have been you know, many uh, many efforts underway to bring the additive, particularly the, the, met, the metal um, additive technologies to uh, creating so highly specialized parts, say in the photolithography systems. And uh, as the, um, the shortage uh, gets more accurate, you know, the need to run these, uh, these fabs continuously with extremely high reliability is, is very important and uh, any need to very rapidly diagnose uh, the underlying issue in a in a semiconductor fab equipment make a replacement of you know a, a, a defective part and 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 bring it quickly back to the fab uh, is a perfect use case for 3d printing and you can have a very fast turnaround time uh, for the replacement maintenance and the repair scenarios there so uh, to deal with the shortage that the world is experiencing right now, how is 3D printing going to help that? Uh, um, how is it going to fasten the entire process? And uh, also uh, to deal with this, with this shortage, the industry needs to create semiconductors faster, but without compromising on the testing and quality check, which is kind of a heart of semiconductor. So is 3D ready to help them in this area also? Mm. See, the current shortage is strictly not a product design problem. You know, it's a manufacturing and supply problem. The delivery lead times in semiconductors uh, are already inherently long due to the complexity of manufacturing process. You know, a, a typically large company you know, has to deal with, you know, say 500 types of packages, you know, 400 upwards of different types of chip dies, multiple technologies and, you know, 2000 plus process steps and the lead times can be several months long 20 to 26 uh, month, uh, weeks of which you know uh, much larger portion is uh, is spent in the front end process uh, the wafer fabrication process uh, up, to, up to up to 20 weeks and over six weeks uh, in the back end for assembly and test 
so uh, the in order to uh, to deal with that complexity there, there is still a large amount of you know uh, transformation is needed you know so there is there is this superficial problem of you know demand uh, patterns that are coming and and they are not being able to cope uh, but uh, in this whole manufacturing and the and the supply chain of semiconductor there are tremendous opportunities uh, to to have the the right visibility and control so for example from a manufacturing flexibility standpoint uh, you know you have to uh, deal with uh, the uh, allocation of the various uh, semiconductor uh, chips to the various um, uh, plants and the processes have to go through a, a large number of steps so all this can be modeled in a model based uh, uh, engineering paradigm so you have a a, a complete uh, view of the the bill of material as it evolves through the various manufacturing process steps in the front end and in the back end uh, there is also the issue of uh, uh, multiple sourcing uh, from various suppliers you know to in order to mitigate the risks and have the right volumes and how to model that in your uh, in your product definition uh, there is also the need for cross manufacturing you know being able to produce the same chip and in more than one fabs being able to qualify uh, that upfront technology wise and and customer wise uh, routing of the product through this whole supply network uh, dynamically depending on you know whether you want to uh, prioritize the uh, the supply order for a very strategic customer or you want to prioritize the routing uh, to the network of a very high margin product so all this flexibility uh, can be created through this model based uh, engineering and model based uh, manufacturing approach and you know, have this associativity all the way from design to manufacturing and through supply chain and then through in the course of the uh, the supply execution itself, you know, you can have a model based uh, supply planning approach, you know, wherein you are able to better connect the, the demand uh, from the various customers and uh, and partners uh, with your available supply networks, uh, being able to uh, to produce the right volumes in the right fabs according to the right uh, KPIs. So all this uh, can be orchestrated, you know, through a, a complete model-based uh, approach from uh, design to manufacturing to supply chain. So, the, so in a sense, you know, there is there is a tremendous opportunity to uh, improve the responsiveness of the semiconductor fabs and the and the and OEMs to address this uh, this current shortage. Now, obviously, uh, there is some redesign of the products is also necessary. Um, for the OEMs, you know, to take into account alternate uh, suppliers to components, you know, that are currently facing acute shortages. So there is some redesign going on in terms of, um, you know, having that um, that flexibility in your product development. So those those development cycles are again happening. But again, within this model-based engineering approach and being able to apply, you know, various um, simulation technologies you know uh, the companies can very quickly re-engineer or incrementally re-engineer the product and validate it and bring it faster to the market still okay so uh, we we see that the number of connected devices are soon going to multiply considerably and uh, with wearable devices when it comes to healthcare uh, when it comes to education entertainment so these connected devices are just going to take over everything so uh, how does this open up an opportunity for 3D printing uh, in IC designing? And what are some of the challenges and trends you foresee in this space? See, the connected devices are, are going to be pervasive in the sense of entirely new form factors, the range of you know, wireless connectivity, the kind of sensing abilities it's going to have, and, and the underlying need for a sustainable power supply to make them uh, more autonomous right so in that sense the ic design has to has to go to the next level of you know like more than more 
in the sense of you know going beyond the current uh, the nano scale limitations with newer technologies such as you know 3D packaging with the system in package with 3D stacking of dyes on a smaller footprint or substrate like PCBs you know for instance uh, that that one has been uh, out there uh, say in iPhone X you know where Apple was able to reduce 30 percent uh, volume of the motherboard you know while all the chips uh, remained as they are so all these things you know require now an integrated system level design approach you know wherein uh, the um, the r d must consider a holistic design from the chip to the package to the multiple uh, boards pcb boards level design also integrate uh, other important uh, design say the battery design in there you know from a power sustenance standpoint and that also brings a lot of multi physics phenomena in there so you have to um, test and uh, from the standpoint of structural integrity thermal uh, behaviors electromagnetics uh, and as the uh, as the electronics and semiconductors get more privacy the very uh, one other very interesting phenomena that's happening is 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 the shift of semiconductor ip and the design capacity gradually in house you know unlike you know totally relying on the external you know semiconductor providers you know so there is and this is happening because there, there was going to be specialized chips for everything chips for data centers ai machine learning automotive I mean, it's already you know, becoming pervasive with electrification battery power management networking so you name you name it there is going to be an asic a specialized asic for that so that the, the underlying challenge there is the um, it's the need to build the competency to develop uh, chips in house for differentiation to have a strong roadmap for your products and time to market and so just as every company has become a software company virtually every manufacturing company is going to become a semiconductor company from a design standpoint in the in the next 10 years in some ways uh, so this will require the uh, the new com new, the new workforce of the future you know wherein you have a strong electronics design competencies a system design co competencies in house also new methods for development of electronics much rapidly unlike you know the current long lead times on the semiconductors and the, the microelectronics so for instance the modularization of uh, the, the system on chips with chiplet uh, like architecture which is more ip based you know as the uh, the use of ip in building semiconductor grows uh, uh, seven times every 10 years and so this ip management and the modularity is, is going to be critical so these are some of the the, the trends you know we are seeing uh, uh, in the electronics and the semiconductor design as the connected devices get pervasive so you rightly mentioned that many of the semiconductor of fab manufacturing is going to go in-house, especially uh, looking at the current times when the industry is facing a shortage of semiconductors and, and the demand is high, supply is quite slow right now. So uh, how can this 3D printing bridge that gap, help these companies save costs, become really faster? I won't say go to market because they are going to use it in-house. So how, how is this going to help it and what kind of opportunity lies for the salt there? Yeah, so um, the uh, right now the, the 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 use of semiconductors is on a on a specialization basis and a differentiation basis. So there is this mix of you know uh, relying on some key semiconductor uh, design partners or the end chip providers and and bringing few in house. Um, mm -hmm. But the, that's that's also going to be part of. Uh, more of a the IP uh, marketplace, if you will. You know the way it has happened in the mechanical space. You know the ability to to very quickly go out and find uh, the right supplier for a specific type of a mechanical or electrical component. You know that that same uh, ecosystem for 
uh, IP uh, for semiconductor and electronics design is, 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 is going to grow, right? And so with that uh, comes the need to have a, a much better visibility on what kind of IP is coming, uh, coming into my product, uh, you know, how, uh, how mature it is, who are the suppliers, then the, there is also the compliance angle, there is a royalty and licensing angle, all that has to be traced uh, uh, from the incoming uh, sources of the IP all the way into your product lines and through the life of the products. Uh, there is also a, a strong need for validation of IP from a performance, reliability perspective, manufacturability perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is the need to uh, to manage the IP in a in a platform based way. You know, this is not just in you know, a transactional issue any longer because you know that's really the core of the innovation and and the engine to to give you the faster time to market and the and the differentiation. Uh, so uh, so we can think of you know various solutions along the way to manage the integrity of the IP, the the modularity of the products based on IPs, uh, verific continuous verification and validation across different kinds of IP, and uh, and then the uh, the handover of the the design for. Uh, the testing and the uh, new product introduction cycles. Uh, so this is really a, a, a nice play for a digital innovation platform uh, that can lend itself to this semiconductor based innovation. Okay. So uh, Mahesh, uh, the entire semiconductor industry is moving faster towards thinner chips. And how is 3D going to help uh, um, achieve this thinner chip, especially when it comes to electronic skin? It's going to be as thin as your skin. So what is the challenge for the 3D industry as well when it comes to electronic skin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, the, the semiconductors are not only getting thinner, but also as part of the whole product package, they are getting a lot more flexible. They are, uh, they are becoming... Uh, higher density products really. And so that brings the need for ultra low power processors, you know, communication chips, memory, all that integrated, still mounted on a printed circuit board, you know, to form a system level solution. And so that brings the need to, to have the right interfaces, the battery sensors and all that. And, you know, you're, that's, why, that's why you're seeing the newer applications coming in wearables, uh, autonomous robotics and, and like you said, the electronics skins for medical monitoring and, and other types of applications. So this also brings in the need for, for new material innovation. And when you put all that together, the testing becomes all the more difficult because of all the, the complexity and the, and, the, and the high functional integration. So in terms of use case, you know, we can think of uh, uh, the need to design uh, new materials, whether organic or inorganic um, uh, silicon or otherwise substrates. Uh, so we have uh, solutions in terms of 3D molecule level mo modeling and uh, mechanical property simulation at material level. And mm -hmm. then, uh, then we have uh, structural analysis in terms of deformation and warping and, and other kinds of you know, analysis through uh, the various simulation uh, tools, wireless connectivity simulation. So the antenna is, is still a, is a key component of uh, the e-scan or, or, or all these type of you know, uh, connected products. So whether the antenna is a chip level antenna or a PCB mounted antenna, uh, so the antenna could be custom designed. So we have to have an optimum placement of the antenna from a reception uh, performance standpoint. Uh, and then there is all kinds of electromagnetics uh, interference compatibilities to be assessed through a electromagnetic simulation. And the antenna is also uh, interacting a lot with the rest of the device. It's not acting in isolation. So uh, the uh, with the structure of the device uh, in terms of you know, creating the resonance or in along with the battery and so all that uh, has to be really assessed through a holistic you know uh, multi-physics uh, electronic simulation uh, there is also 
the uh, human aspect to consider in his skin and, and these applica variables application. Uh, so we have uh, to, you know, to perform a, a, a SAR, you know, uh, uh, standard absorption uh, rate um, uh, type of simulation to check the impact on uh, of the radiation, antenna radiation on the human tissue. Uh, so there is a tremendous need for various, you know, 3D based virtual technologies to to deal with this complexity and the miniaturization and be able to test multitude of scenarios that are not just possible to test in a in a physical way but so you have to front load those in the virtual world mm -hmm. okay so let us talk about the telecommunication industry right now there is so much of revolution happening there with 5g uh and and there still lies a lot of challenge especially uh when it comes to countries like india which still are struggling with uh, uh, having a proper 4g connection so how is 3G going to help them achieve this 5G uh, motive, you can say the goal, and enhance the user experience and customer service? Yeah, see 5G is coming, but it's coming in a in a hybrid mode uh, to begin with. So you, we're going to see many converged uh, network sites with a mix of you know 4G plus 5G. And, and so there's a lot of effort going on for network densification, depending on the the topology and the urban landscape and other special needs there is a configuration density so not not there is not just one type of uh, network site you know you'll have macro cells to uh, uh, to small cells to you know very small you know uh, distributed antenna uh, cells so various kinds of configuration and uh, to serve various types of you know capacity and latency needs there is also regulatory pressure for carrier aggrega aggregation and uh, spectrum sharing. So maintaining quality of service and uh, and be, being able to recover quickly from outages and planned downtimes is really critical for customer satisfaction, right? So from the standpoint of the telecom operators, having a complete view of the network site uh, not just the uh, the physical infrastructure out there, but like in terms of its um, logical layer, in terms of its um, uh, its uh, network layer is extremely important. So we can envision this uh, virtual twin of the the network sites uh, all together from the standpoint of uh, issue detection, degradation of service, or being able to plan. Uh, net, new network upgrades and being able to do that uh, without excessive site visits and the interruption uh, to the ongoing service. So uh, there are newer technologies in the sense of you know having a 3D um, complete 3D as built view of the bill of information. Uh, in having a uh, realistic uh, 3D work instructions for the service delivery, whether it is for upgrades or some some quick maintenance, so uh, the telecom operators can evolve from a, a document and kind of physical monitoring based approach to a more model based and a, and this hybrid you know virtual plus you know physical approach there. Uh, then we have the um, the 5G uh, network equipment players, you know, and many of them are uh, helping the operators in in the network rollout and the managed services. So they are taking often the responsibility of managing and operating an entire site. And so this uh, this issue of you know being able to quickly uh, roll out a site, and uh, for that you know we we. we we can think of technologies like uh, BIM, building information management, to, to get a complete view of the various construction deliverables, all the design assets, in such a way that uh, that the, um, the telecom company uh, is able to perform these network upgrades and expansions with uh, uh, minimum site surveys. Uh, then you know we have with uh, 5G also an extraordinary um, complexity with uh, active antennas and the various configurations it can bring. 
So you cannot test these, these active antennas uh, just in the in a lab settings, you know, because an antenna is is subject to the real world, you know, environmental uh, constraints like wind loads, you know, rains. I mean, all all kinds of uh, situations, site constraints depending on the uh, the uh, the neighborhood around the on the site. So the form factor of the antenna, the the coverage, throughput, uh, interference, you know, that it might be subject to, all this needs to be simulated in a, in a dynamic environment. Uh, there is also with 5G, uh, some new uh, data streaming uh, technologies uh, being added, such as the massive memo, beam forming uh, behaviors. So all this uh, can be tested uh, without uh, incurring the physical prototype testing or on-site testing uh, with uh, you know, holistic uh, multi-physics you know, simulation approach uh, you know, because of uh, various uh, use cases that have to be tested all, all in conjunction. Mm -hmm. Nice insights, Mahesh. Uh, so before we conclude, would you like to add something to our conversation today? And especially when it comes to the uh, world of 3D uh, in the world of electronics. Right. So uh, the, this notion of uh, virtual twin and a model based enterprise, even though it began in the core industrial manufacturing world in aerospace and automotive, it has rapidly made its way into the world of high tech and electronics. You know, wherein you know we have now the maturity of looking at electronics as the whole system and being able to design this whole system uh, and manage the evolution of that system uh, in its uh, in its individual pieces in the mechanical, electrical, electronics, but also in its overall performance mm -hmm. and uh, and being able to uh, to to deliver this uh, with a faster time to market and uh, with the right quality and with the right cost. Uh, so the time to apply the, uh, the, the 3D uh, virtual technologies, virtual twin and model-based enterprise is now, and that uh, uh, the electronics uh, companies, whether OEM or in the supply chain can tremendously benefit from Taking this platform-based approach to the uh, the R&D of the the new electronic space products, uh, but also uh, continue that downstream in the value chain into um, testing and into manufacturing and supply chain. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you for such a wonderful insight on 3D and the electronic industry. It's really good to know how 3D is going to play an important role within the entire industry, not just when it comes to saving costs, but also when it comes to developing, uh, bridging the gap there exists between the demand and supply, and what is there even for the telecommunication industry. So I thank you for uh, your time today and providing these valuable insights, and I look forward to connect with you soon. It was nice talking with you, Anamika. Same here, Mahesh. Thank you. Hello, friends. Thank you, friends, for joining us today uh, for this Insights Conversation. For more such details about the electronic industry, please uh, follow us on our YouTube channel and press, press the bell button to get the continuous notification for any new video being uploaded on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. All right. Thanks.